You ever see someone in public who's struggling and you really want to help them, but you're too shy to do it because you're afraid other people will judge you? Well, have you ever considered the fact that it's not worth thinking about the opinions of people who will judge you for just trying to make the world a better place? Trust your good intentions. Anyway, guys, I hope you guys are enjoying the latest chapter in Cal Kestis's journey as a Jedi. And if the video games aren't your thing, well, stay tuned to this channel. We'll be putting up our own playthrough with our own commentary shortly. Me and Kanga will do all the damn platforming and puzzles so that you guys don't have to. Also, for those of you who are interested in getting your hands on a replica Cal Kestis lightsaber for your own playthrough, check out the new Chaos X bundle from our sponsor, Onasaber.com. The Chaos X replicates Cal's lightsaber, which he acquired from Master Jaro Tapal, who was mortally wounded by blaster fire during Order 66. That incident actually damages Jaro's lightsaber, which you can see in the hilt of the Chaos X. The Chaos X is available in both standard RGB tube configuration or the pixel board configuration. Configuration, which means, like this blade right here, you have a LED running alongside the length of the entire tube so that you can do all sorts of cool things like that. And uh, if you guys are into sparring and really hitting these things hard, I do recommend you check out the standard RGB tube instead. Order the KSX for your playthrough of Jedi Survivor and you'll get the scabbard included for free as long as you purchase it in the bundle, which we'll link down in the description below. This is a time limited special, so check it out. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. Now, one of the things I want you guys to think about when you're going through Jedi Survivor is how Cal Kestis has redefined what it means to be a Jedi. It's arguably one of the most important professions in all of Star Wars. It's definitely the role that most young fans assume when they're pretending that they're in Star Wars. In the original trilogy, the Jedi were mysterious and not too much was known about them, their belief or skills. They were kind of just these generic monk-like good guys. Everything we knew about their belief system came from a handful of vague quotes from Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda. The Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. Many of these sayings were actually taken from other belief systems or philosophies in life. And although they served the movie trilogy well, these were just individual thoughts that did not come together and form an actual belief system. And back then that was okay because you know, people back then were a little different in how they consumed media. People would see a few movies in theater every year. They would watch the same dozen TV channels at home. There wasn't even cable back then or renting VHSs so that you can watch things at home, pause and rewind as you please. The only way you're gonna watch Star Wars a second time was by going to a theater for a second time. It's not that people were necessarily starved for content back then. There was just greater appreciation for the content that existed and people were more focused on the content that existed and took a longer time digesting that content when compared to today's, you know, lightning fast uh, streaming services. And so those vague lines about the force formed an entire religion, a belief system that was brought to life by fans and fans alone. I mean, George Lucas more or less abandoned Star Wars for quite some time until a writer known as Timothy Zahn created the Thrawn series and that became so popular that George Lucas realized he had an opportunity here to make some more money. I mean, to make another trilogy. The prequels did the opposite of what the original trilogy did with the Jedi. We perhaps learned too much about the Order, about the Force, about the midichlorians, and any logical person would quickly come to a conclusion that the Jedi we had lionized for so long amongst the Star Wars fandom had major flaws at the institutional level. As an organization, the Jedi might have been well-intentioned, but they also were quite hypocritical. So many of the things that they preached against, like letting one's fear take over control, was practiced by the highest ranking members of the Jedi Order. Anakin Skywalker, the chosen one, was not denied training because of some mistake the young boy made or some inherent evil the boy possessed. Instead, he got rejected basically because of a technicality. He is too old. An apprentice you have, Qui-Gon. Impossible to take out a second. The code forbids it. And then we had the sequel trilogy and the message more or less became this. Let the past die. Kill it if you have to. Buying an IP with a very passionate fan base is not for everyone, Disney. 
But they eventually realize that you can't just break everything and start a new story. Franchises are only popular when you invest time in the characters that are involved in the stories and to create the type of characters that are popular in the Star Wars franchise, well, that can take many years, decades, multiple books, TV shows, and movies. And so not surprisingly, the current generation of Star Wars content it, it actually is sandwiched in between kind of the stuff we like, you know, the Clone Wars and the Galactic Empire all pretty much takes place in this time period, except for the Mandalorian, which takes place a little after. We never really got to see Jedi during this time period. And now we've had an entire mediocre show about Obi-Wan Kenobi doing his best to stay alive on Tatooine. We've even caught a glimpse of the backstory of Kanan Jarrus, who also escaped Order 66. No part of the franchise has done a better job at showing us what it's like to be an Order 66 survivor than Jedi Fallen Order and now Jedi Survivor. In all honesty, Cal Kestis has quickly turned into one of the most likable Jedi in the franchise, but also one of the more important ones. And that's because I truly believe his own journey to becoming a Jedi Knight without the help of any other living Jedi, something that Kanan Jars, Luke Skywalker, and a few other, I guess, post-Order 66 Jedi experienced is a very important lesson that a lot of the audience and new writers for Disney can learn from. It could also inform us about how future Jedi Orders that are more sustainable could be created. You know, Cal Kestis was a Padawan when Order 66 occurred, and he immediately went into hiding. And like most successful Order 66 survivors, Cal was incredibly disciplined when it came to hiding who he really was. He never waved around his lightsaber, and it was only when his pal Prof was at risk of death by gravity that he used the Force. And somehow he was spotted. Those probe droids are pretty good. You know, before this happened, while he was in exile, that was actually a really important period in Cal's life. Not only because he was a teenager, and those were like you know, very transformative years in a young man's life, but also because of what he as a Jedi went through. Sometimes the absence of something can be as impactful as the presence of something. Like all Jedi youngling, Cal Kessis would have belonged to a clan within the Jedi, and together his clan would have been taught by all the masters in the Order, like Yoda, or perhaps even Kelleran Beck. The type of training he was gonna get at this stage of his career was more basic, you know, how to use a lightsaber, how to levitate things with a force. But the philosophy and the ethics of what it really meant to be a Jedi, this wasn't something you would understand at the age of five. I mean, even when Cal Kessis was, you know, 10 years old, that's when Order 66 happened. I don't even think he was ready for that talk at that point either. And so the point here is Cal Kessis learned all the basics and at the same time wasn't old enough to get indoctrinated in the institutional thinking of the Jedi Order or its ideology, which again was heavily based on fear and a desire to control all of its members. Instead, during his formulative teenage years, Cal Kestis did nothing related to being a Jedi. Instead, he had to grow up quickly, learn how to be a day laborer, and also keep his past hidden. A lot of people might think, oh, this is a tough situation for him to be, this is bad for a young child to go through, but I would argue you should be wary of pitying people who go through hardship, just like you should be wary of not pitying people who have no hardship in their life, right? Being a teenager is tough enough already, but being a teenager ex-Jedi during Order 66, that will break a weak person, but it will make a great Jedi. And actively trying to hide that you're a Jedi all those years meant that Cal Kestis spent five years undoing everything he could, unlearning everything he was taught. And he was actually really successful at that, which is why in the beginning of Jedi Fallen Order, you basically have no skills. It's a fun gameplay mechanic that actually ties into the story very well. And so by the time Jedi Fallen Order starts, Cal Kestis will have spent two thirds of his life becoming a Jedi and one third of his life undoing becoming a Jedi. Now there's nothing incredibly rewarding and challenging with taking such drastic turns in your life. A Jedi technically never gets a chance to leave the Order to put a pause on what they're doing. And when they usually do leave, coming back is not an option. But Cal Kestis was forced into this situation and while he was in exile, he probably did a lot of soul searching on what his previous life meant. He had a lot of time to think about the theory of being a Jedi without actually practicing it. And even though having the force, being able to manipulate your environment around you seems like one of the most amazing things when you grow up with something like this, an innate ability that you already have, you have much less of an appreciation until it's taken away from you. And that's what happens here. I mean, I don't think Count Kestis understood how gifted he was until he lost everything. 
And initially, it seemed like Cal forgot about everything. It's, it's almost as if he wanted to continue living as a scrapper. But adventure seems to have a way of finding individuals like Cal who have the right tools to save the world. And as he began to realize once again that he needed to fight once again, uh, not because of some selfish desire for revenge or hatred, but because he wanted to protect other people, he started relearning how to become a Jedi once again as a much more mature individual who can still kind of recollect a lot of that training he had forgotten. Cal Kestis is actually able to go through a lot of things that most Jedi would go through only once in their life and at a very young age where it's not meaningful. And so Cal actually goes to a loom as an adult and gets another lightsaber. He goes through the gathering ritual as an adult. He's constantly haunted by the death of his master during Order 66. Cal believed that he could have saved his master had he been a better student. But because Cal is much more mature than he once was, he's able to come to a realization that he did try his best. He's able to forgive himself as a result. Cal gets to do something that I think a lot of people wish we had an opportunity to do at a much younger age. He's able to reflect on his early childhood when he technically still is a child. When the memories are still fresh in his head, when he's still able to remember all of those early lessons as a Jedi that now as an older individual he's able to interpret much better. And because he was relearning how to be a Jedi, he could skip lessons he didn't need and draw on the lessons he needed immediately because of whatever crazy situation he was going through. And because of his young age and the lack of written records to use as reference, Cal's actual training doesn't just come from the Jedi Order. Instead, it's more natural and instinctive. Whenever he confronts a problem, he goes and meditates and tries to remember the force technique that is needed to solve that problem. It's a very reverse kind of way of learning things. Now, Cal's use of the force would become very practical and based on his actual needs. It's a very minimalistic style of training that I think fits closer to what the Jedi are actually supposed to be. You see, the Jedi, need to have a close connection to the Force, so close that they almost cease thinking and become kind of a part of the subconscious that is the cosmic force. Everything the Jedi Order set up, you know, all the rules, the codes, the, the, the punishments, these are created by human beings, imperfect individuals, and these are rules that were created based on fear mostly. And because using the force is all mental, if your mind is clouded with a million protocols and a million more philosophies of what you should do and why, I imagine your power is gonna suffer. And I think that's something the Jedi Order never realized, especially in those latter days when it was so blinded by nonsense, politics, the war, that they couldn't even smell the Sith Lords in their office. They didn't even realize how powerless they had become. And I think most of the problems within the Jedi Institution actually come from fear. And all of this fear stems from the Jedi's original sin, which is the creation of the dark side, the Sith. You know, uh, there are many different ways this story is told through canon and, and legends and everything else in between, but more or less the original Jedi, the Jedi, whatever you want to call them, they practice light side and dark sides of the Force within themselves, as in they try to understand what the dark side and light side in every person was, and they learn how to control it internally instead of just focusing on one side of the Force. What eventually would happen is one group of Force users would start focusing more on the dark side until they were more or less consumed by it and its power. Or at least that's how the Jedi frame the story. We're supposed to believe that all you know individuals without proper Jedi training are just gonna become uh, dark lords and crazy Sith, but you know, Cal Kessis is a great example of that not happening. Luke Skywalker, Rey Skywalker. There are a lot of people who never had any Jedi training and turn out completely fine. I would argue that many of these initial dark side force users were simply just curious from an intellectual, philosophical, or perhaps even scientific point of view. I'm pretty sure that the first dark side force users weren't inherently evil or, or, or lusting over power. They wouldn't have been accepted in the Jedi Order in the first place, right? And so the real original sin is not these Force users learning the dark side, it's actually how the mainstream Jedi institutions crack down on these various dark side Force using factions. Sometimes the Jedi would exile them, sometimes they would kill them and massacre them. What they wouldn't do is listen to them and try to find a way to coexist. There could have been some really amazing research being done, you know, fully sanctioned Jedi research on the dark side, what it is, 
why it causes people to go insane. And instead, what the Jedi did was just close their minds off to anything from the dark side. They became fearful of it. If you take a look at the Jedi Order in the Golden Age of the Republic before the Clone Wars, it was a complete mess. It was bureaucratic, cold, and unfeeling. The organization was run by old Jedi Masters who rarely even went into the field. They were huddled around their tower on Coruscant, blinded from the Force by Darth Sidious, and blinded from the reality of the situation in the galaxy by their lack of exposure to the wider world. I imagine all the input they were getting was from the holograms and emergency reports from Jedi Knights in the most dire situation all across the galaxy. I don't care how wise and wrinkly your forehead is, if you're isolated in a tower and the only information you're receiving from the wider world are terrible reports of disaster and violence, that is going to affect how you see things. Your judgment is going to be off. You're going to have a heightened sense of fear. If you think about it, all of these Jedi Masters were suffering from something known as Mean World Syndrome. This is actually a uh, communications term devised in the age of radio and TV. It basically states that an individual who gets all of their information from the wider world through screens, in today's age it's more like social media and internet, uh, they'll be bombarded basically by news which is slanted towards negativity because that's what we as human beings uh, are attracted to. You know, it is a survival mechanism to be alerted about danger, but we never evolved properly to deal with social media, which just sends danger, 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 danger to us constantly. And yes, this makes us feel like the world is a more dangerous and difficult place. This makes us more paranoid, more conservative and fearful. And this is what I believe was happening to all of the Jedi Masters, the leaders of the Order. And so the Jedi were too busy worrying about everything and thinking the end of days was coming to have the time or the right mentality to take into account the various needs of individuals like Anakin or Qui-Gon or Dooku or other not typical Jedi. I mean, how could they? They were a huge organization at this point and when you scale up anything, it becomes harder and harder to preserve your original message, your original product. And so protocols and general rules that fit the majority but not the minority began ruling the Jedi instead of well-meaning masters trying to custom create the perfect education for their younglings. I mean, Count Dooku's departure from the Jedi was the result of a half a century, if not more, of being disappointed and being told by his superiors that what he was interested in was completely dangerous, things like Jedi prophecies. The idea is that prophecies show us a Jedi's future, but in very vague terms, and a Jedi could become fearful if their future is not bright, and that might lead them to do rash things. Which is exactly what happened to Dooku anyway, because he just broke into the restricted section in the Hogwarts library and read the prophecy of you-know-who on his own free time. Look, if there's one thing that the older generation always gets wrong with the younger generation, it's their attempt to suppress the passion and motivation the younger generations have for you know, whatever they're doing in their lives. And that's usually because the older generation doesn't understand the younger generations. They don't understand that one day, uh, these young people, the stupid thing they're into, it'll probably be mainstream because they're all gonna grow up one day and become consumers. I mean, when I was young, uh, video games and watching Star Wars was not a viable path uh, uh, to, to, to create a profession and career. And look at me, I'm, I'm a freaking YouTuber now and I mainly play video games and watch Star Wars movies for a living. And, and of course, you know, every generation makes this mistake because it's a part of the natural process of aging. We become uh, more and more conservative. We become more closed-minded as we suffer more and more setbacks as our own dreams get crushed and, and our own our limitations are reached. But to do that to a younger generation, that is, that is so cruel. I mean, it used to be that knowledge was the most important thing on earth. I mean, books and information were the key to success and that's because not everyone had access. This was before the internet was widespread. Back then, you went to a library, you had to learn the Dewey Decimal System. And if you were relatively wealthy, your parents might, you know, get you an entire set of encyclopedia books at home, but that still only had a small fraction of all the knowledge every person with a phone has access to today. I mean, this is really the problem with having really, really old people in positions of power, whether it's a corporation, a you know, government, or the Jedi Order. And it's not ageism, guys, it's common sense. There's a reason why we uh, you know, don't let people vote until they're 18 years old. There's a reason why we don't let people run for president until they're in their 30s. 
So why are we allowing people who are you know, 70 or 80 years old to run for office? There should be a limit on that end of the spectrum as well. Anyway, ideally, the Jedi should have just focused more on personal relationships instead of larger rules to govern everything. In many ways, they were already well suited to do so. The master apprentice system was awesome. It's a time-tested method. And it's probably the only reason why many Jedi turn out normal. And that's because teaching a young person isn't as difficult as you think. You just have to show up, have good intentions, and not have a toxic relationship. And as long as you continue to show up and protect that child from, you know, whatever great dangers are out in the galaxy, I think they'll be completely fine. A Jedi Master's job is not to just impose restrictions and prevent their younglings from going to the dark side. That's like a really pessimistic way of going into this relationship. A Master's job is to figure out what their apprentice's uh, passions and motivations are, and then, uh, you know, helping that younger person channel all that positive energy into something more productive. Imagine a world where Count Dooku was able to study what he wanted with proper supervision from an older, wiser Jedi that could prevent him from going astray. Count Dooku was never destined to be evil. He just became so bitter because of all the bureaucracy and nonsense he experienced within the Jedi Order. He wasn't a bad person, he was just different, perhaps a bit more intelligent than your average Jedi Knight. And for that, because they were afraid he was going to turn into the dark side because he didn't fit into their system, he actually did turn into the dark side. The saddest thing about Count Dooku was he started out as a really good individual. He wanted to prove himself. I mean, most Jedi want to do good initially. Anakin wanted nothing but to protect his loved ones, a very noble desire. Even though some Jedi were always destined to go to the dark side because of their personality or whatever, far more Jedi went to the dark side because of the Jedi's very restrictive way of doing things. Remember, the original sin of the Jedi was this. They're the ones who created the Sith in the first place because they could not find a compromise. The Jedi really don't need to set rules to govern themselves. They can just follow the rules that all other citizens in the galaxy follow. They're not special. They don't need an institutionalized belief system, a one-size-fit-all dogma, because they're not a religious order. The Jedi were always going to be special individuals who just needed special attention and training so that they can get the most out of their potential. And what's important, what makes Cal Kestis so important and so special, what makes his training so great, it's not his experience within the Jedi Order, but the strong foundation that was built around him by the Jedi Order and by his master. By simply being there for Cal, guiding him and influencing him, Gerard Tapal was able to teach this young boy the importance of honor, duty, and compassion. If you build a strong moral foundation for a young person, they should be able to understand exactly what they should or should not do. I mean, if you really have to create rules like don't kill an innocent person, then what exactly are we doing here? What are we teaching people that you need to remind them of this? Uh, you know, the problem with rules and restrictions is that they're not perfect. They're not a one-size-fit-all solution. And a lot of times, you can gain a lot by bending the rules for specific people who are in specific situations. And if you don't do that, the amount of trauma and, and resentment you can create, like in Anakin's case or Dooku's case, could create all the problems you were afraid of in the very beginning. And look at Cal, look at how awesome he turns out as a human being. Forget about being a Jedi, he's willing to risk his own safety to save his pal from falling to death. He's able to quickly tell that former Jedi Terra Malikos is bad intentioned and that the dark side Death Mary Knight Sister Mirren could be an ally. I mean, had Cal been institutionalized, had he been a Mace Windu style Jedi, he might have immediately trusted Tarn for no reason other than because he's a fellow Jedi. Cal has proven time and time again with only the most basic training and life lessons from his master that he is more than ready to fight the dark side. He never joins forces with a second sister. He never succumbs to even Darth Vader. And that's because he didn't really need anyone to tell him the dark side was evil because he already understood that the dark side was evil. And that's because he understood who he was as a person. He understood what values he represented. And that really just comes from his master-apprentice relationship. It's from having a father figure in his life, something the Jedi clearly don't want young ones to develop, obviously. And so in the future, if you're ever responsible for creating, I don't know, a curriculum or a set of rules for an organization, don't just focus on creating punitive measures that prevent people from doing the wrong thing. Teach people why it's wrong in the first place. 
Don't be reactionary. Tell people how to get ahead of the game. So there you have it, guys. That is my analysis on Cal Kestis. I think his uh, journey to becoming a Jedi Knight was really remarkable because he did it outside of the Jedi Order. This is definitely something we should take a closer look at, and maybe in the future this is what the Jedi Order looks like. A lot more decentralized and a lot more focused on the master and apprentice relationship, the most important parts of the Jedi system. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.